Thank you for joining this webinar from Yellowstone Advisory. Today's company presenting is Tullo Oil, who released their half year results on the 15th of September. So I'm now going to hand over to Rahul Dehir, the Chief Executive Officer, and Leswood, Chief Financial Officer of Tullo Oil, to take us through today's presentation. Hey, well, uh, thank you very much, Alex, and uh, a very good afternoon to everybody for. Uh, taking time to join us. Uh, so Les and I are very glad to have this opportunity to update you on our progress and also I, just to share some thoughts about our strategy and performance. And uh, there's been a lot of questions as Alex said, so, so thank you for those. So what we'll do is we'll keep the presentation itself relatively short so we have the time for, uh, uh, for a chat. So Matt, perhaps if you go to the next uh, slide, really I wanted to start uh, <clears throat> with a reflection on, uh, on, on where we are today uh, as a company. And I think it's those of you who followed us. Uh, Matt, I'm not sure if I'm getting the, the, the refresh, but I hope others are. Uh, <clears throat> so we've done a lot in the last year to really turn the company around, uh, to reset our cost base. Uh, we've done the uh, big transformational refinancing in May. So that simplified our capital structure. And it also put the company on a much firmer financial footing. Uh, our business plan is very clear. Our strategy is clear. We're allocating about 90% of our capital spend to uh, <clears throat> really our West African uh, production assets. Uh, and these generate a lot of value uh, and also cash flow. And uh, we're pleased to say that we're set up to deliver uh, both self-funded production uh, as well as cash flow from these assets. Uh, but Tullo is not just about these. We also have further areas in our portfolio where there is tremendous amount of optionality to unlock value, and that's uh, particularly in Kenya and in our exploration blocks. Uh, we do focus a lot on safe and uh, efficient operations uh, and <clears throat> uh, particular focus on unlocking value for our host governments and also through shared prosperity, delivering value uh, to our local communities and do all this uh, while minimizing uh, the environmental impact of our business. Um, now, what I'm also pleased to say, we've got a tremendous legacy, really a long history in Africa. And we'll talk more about the kind of future, but really we feel we're well positioned to continue uh, as a leader in the, in, the, in the oil and gas industry in Africa. <clears throat> so what have we done over the past year? If we go to the next slide, uh, we, you'll remember uh, in November last year, so that's a little over 11 months ago, we delivered, we had a capital markets day. And uh, we shared uh, a number of uh, areas where we would focus on. And what I'm pleased to say is that we're delivering well uh, on those. So what are those? Uh, so on the left on the slide, uh, again, Matt, I'm not sure if, I, it's, if it's progressed. Okay, there you go, thank you. Uh, so we're delivering uh, sustainable and self-funded production. Uh, that's something we said we would do. We have improved our operational performance in Ghana. Uh, so today we've been consistently having uptime in the kind of high 90s, 98%, uh, versus going back in 2019, the uptime in Jubilee, for example, was about 84%. So tangible difference in that. Uh, the drilling performance has improved dramatically. Uh, we started drilling in April, uh, we were drilling our wells uh, uh, cheaper, faster than what we did before. Uh, and I'll talk more about the, the, the impact of those. Uh, <clears throat> there is a multi-year multi, multi -year investment program that's underway with investments across Jubilee and 10. And that's really underpins the growth of the company as we go forward. Uh, we have delivered a revised uh, development plan for Kenya. Uh, that's a tremendous source of value, we believe, going forward. Uh, and we've continued to rationalize and unlock value from the exploration portfolio. And that aligns much more with our production focus strategy. I talked about the debt refinancing that simplifies the capital structure. Uh, and there is a tremendous focus on cost. And we've evolved our ESG strategy with a, a focus on and a commitment to net zero by 2030. So these were all the things that we talked about 11 months ago that we were going to do and we've done that. So it feels good to kind of be able to articulate that. Uh, also, uh, the work obviously doesn't stop there. We're very focused on delivering value. Uh, and what we've done is we've refined the plan 
for 2021 to 2025. So we had talked about a 10 year plan, but we've now kind of, if you will, focused in on the next five years. And what I've highlighted in the middle column here uh, is some very exciting kind of near term catalysts. And I think that for you as, as, as shareholders, it should provide you some line of sight, both to the growth and the value creation of the business. And when you look at the business plan over the next five years, it's a clear path to value creation. It's going to deliver growth in production reserves uh, and underlying value. And critically also with the cash flow, which is support the deal leveraging. And our goal is to reduce the gearing to about one and a half times uh, by 2025. Uh, <clears throat> I think before I go into the business, it's important maybe go to the next slide, please, uh, where uh, we really want to talk about the purpose of the company. And this is important because uh, we've taken some time and said, you know, do we want to be in the oil and gas business? And if so, what's our purpose? And I think I want just this is something to feel strongly about. So I think our view is that notwithstanding the ongoing focus on reducing fossil fuels, uh, our view is that the world will continue to consume more energy. Uh, and fossil fuels will remain uh, an integral part of the energy mix for some time to come. You might argue whether it's a, a larger or smaller mix, but we certainly believe that fossil fuels will remain <clears throat> an integral part of the global economy. So what's important is that there's a need for uh, oil and gas to be developed and produced in a responsible manner and with minimal environmental impact. And this is really sort of where we come. I think also what we've experienced firsthand where we work in Africa, whether it's Gabon or Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire or Kenya, you know, our industry can be a real engine for economic development, right? And, and particularly in Africa, there is extreme energy poverty and, you know, paradoxically, you know, very minimal contribution to the, to, to the global emissions. In fact, I think if you, even if you project forward, say till 2040, only 3% or less than 3% of the emissions are expected to come from Africa. Right? So there's a strong case, we believe, for a fair transition where resources in Africa uh, <clears throat> should be given the opportunity to develop, and, but, but done in a way that's responsible. Right? So that certainly kind of defines a little bit of who we are. And <clears throat> I believe it's also a tremendous opportunity for us. So if, if you look at our addressable market, uh, with many companies allocating capital away from upstream, we believe there is a great opportunity for a company like Talo with a legacy and a track record and, and a building sort of operational expertise, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for that. And I think we have an opportunity to be a, a leader in Africa, delivering you know, safe and efficient operations um, and creating value for host nations and for, uh, for our communities. So, <clears throat> and of course the net zero commitment is an integral part of that. And that's a tangible plan with decarbonization initiatives across the two FPSOs, uh, along with now a increasing focus on nature-based carbon offsets. So that's a new area for us and we're building capabilities uh, around that and we hope to talk more about that uh, next year. If I just move on to, uh, from a business plan point of view, uh, we laid out, as I said, a 10-year plan. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, hopefully, and you saw this in the September results, we've improved uh, performance from the business. We've delivered over a billion dollars of self-help that includes asset sales, uh, cost reductions. Uh, and we've, of course, benefited from the improving oil price performance. So what all this has done is it's, it's really kind of created that platform where we could refinance the debt in, um, in, in May. And the refinancing essentially did was it created a headroom. So our nearest kind of long-term maturity now is in 2025. So but what we've demonstrated this year is that when we invest in the business, there's a big resource. So when we invest in the business, we create production growth and, and that generates cash flow. So, so by terming out the maturities, we're creating the heads, headroom to allow us to invest in these high return opportunities. And by reducing the cost structure, obviously we're ensuring that a lot of this is uh, this is <clears throat> self-funded. So what we've done now is uh, we, <coughs> sorry. So, <clears throat> so what we've done is through a combination of uh, <clears throat> the hedging where we've underpinned and protected 
you know, our uh, oil price exposure to kind of in the, in the mid 50s uh, and through cost cuttings uh, and, and this combination of, of creating the headroom and the capital structure, we're able to then deliver uh, the cash flow growth that you see here. So <clears throat> based on at $65 oil over the next five years, we believe we can deliver about $4 billion uh, of operating cash flow. And once you take care of the capex, the deep commissioning, the financing costs, uh, you generate about a billion dollars of free cash flow, which is then can help delever, and that's really what helps us to achieve the one and a half times uh, gearing that I talked about. And how we're doing this, obviously, is is through delivering uh, reliable production performance. And let me just talk about that on the next uh, slide. And and this is important because. For the kind of business that we are, uh, building operational excellence is really fundamental, right? And that's obviously therefore becomes a major focus uh, for the entire organization. So what I wanted to share here is, is some dimensions of what kind of go into the operational performance. Uh, so let me start kind of on the top left. Uh, we're well on our way into the multi-well, multi-year drilling program. Uh, we've got the four well, uh, you know, we have drilled. Uh, three of those wells are on stream now, uh, and the production guidance. I think you saw that we narrowed that upward, so they've certainly been driven by uh, good performance from the new wells as well. And and that drilling performance has been within budget uh, on time. Then, as you move across to the right, we've delivered high uh, uptime on both FPSOs. I talked about that. And that's really kind of an ongoing process. And, I, you know, we talked about this year being a year of transition. And I think certainly uh, we're feeling uh, more comfortable about the transition. The two other aspects which drive production uh, in, in Ghana is one is gas management. And, and really think about this is associated gas. As you produce oil, gas comes out. And uh, we re-inject some of the gas. Uh, we use some gas for our operations as fuel. Uh, and then we are not happy about it, but we flare some gas and then the, the rest we export. Uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so, we've been very consistent in our export supplies. There's been consistent offtake from the government, uh, from GNGC. So, so that's been a good operational story. And as we build our operational track record, uh, the offtake from GNGC is also more consistent because then they get more confidence in the supply. Uh, and further, we have clear plans, and we'll talk more about this from a net zero point of view, which is of improving our gas processing capacity. So we end up eliminating routine flaring by 2025. So that plan very much is underway. And then water injection is important as well because the more water you inject, you keep the pressure of the reservoirs up and you're able to recover uh, more oil. And we've had sustained water injection um, slightly ahead of our expectations of over 200,000 pounds a day. So let me then kind of, so this is kind of a key underpinning. I just want you to have some confidence in the, in the journey that we had on in terms of building operational excellence. Uh, important then to just talk about the underlying assets. Uh, so I'll start with Jubilee. Obviously, that's the big field. And this is a this is a nice slide. I, we had some fun kind of creating this. And what you see here is, it's, well, firstly, it's a big field, right? There's 2 billion barrels of oil in place. You're not going to recover every drop of that. But typically, for a field like this, you'd expect to recover about 40%, uh, <clears throat> potentially more, but in that sort of order of magnitude. Now, we've only produced about half of this. And, and what I wanted to kind of illustrate here is that so what's produced is in blue. So if you look at the chart in the, in the main thing and, and the different colors, they represent the different layers of rock and jubilee, right? So it's a bit of a cartoon. And, and, and what you're able to see is that in the core, we've produced a bit like stay in MH1, we've produced 74%, but then there's still 26% uh, of the estimated recovery left, not the original in place, but of the estimated recovery. Uh, but there are other parts of the core where we still have, you know, more than half, let's say, uh, left to produce. Uh, what's also interesting is the eastern part, uh, particularly Jubilee Southeast uh, and the Jubilee Northeast, we have a tremendous amount of, uh, <coughs> of, of oil still left uh, to be produced. Right? And it's important enough that I just wanted to kind of highlight this uh, specifically. Let me talk a little bit more about the projects here. Um, on the next slide. 
And so, so just so, so, so what we're doing here in the <clears throat> on the eastern flanks of Jubilee, right, is uh, <clears throat> we're doing some 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 basic infrastructure investment. Uh, we use a fancy word called manifolds, but these are imagined kind of at the seabed. Uh, there is a pipeline infrastructure that you install, and you can see that in the picture uh, on the right. So you see the FPSO that's a floating vessel, the processing facilities. In the gray is all the kind of existing infrastructure on the seabed, if you can visualize that. And then <clears throat> what you see in the blue and the green is the new infrastructure that's going to be installed. Uh, and both of these projects are sanctioned and they're underway and, and we will have a lot of CapEx uh, coming into these next year. And what they do then is uh, they they lay the foundation for development in the area. So it's imagine if you're doing a real estate development, you build the roads first, and then you can build the houses and stuff like that. So that's the idea here. Now, uh, Jubilee has a lot of extensive infrastructure, uh, all the gray stuff. So there is a lot of infill potential there. Uh, so that's where a lot of the drilling is happening right now. Uh, but by laying this additional infrastructure, we're going to open up the eastern flanks uh, for further uh, you know, drilling. And that's really kind of, I would say over the next four or five years, a lot of the capital um, goes into that. And these are very high return uh, projects. Uh, so that's the kind of Jubilee story. Uh, and let me switch to uh, so 10. So 10 is smaller uh, than Jubilee. It's still big field. A billion barrels is a lot of oil. Uh, it's more complex. So we're targeting at least today, about a 30% recovery. So contrast that with the over 40%. So you might say, why is it 30? It reflects the complexity of, of the 10 um, fields. So 10 is, is not one field, actually. It's, it's made up of multiple fields. So it's uh, Twan and Boa, that's the T, and Yendra, and in Tomin, you can see those uh, in the in the in the picture here. Uh, a lot of the focus historically, uh, and please don't ask me why, but this is is been on Enyandra. So that's the kind of thin, uh, kind of squiggly sort of section which is in the dark green. Uh, again, the same format here. So the the orange kind of gives you a sense of what's left, and what you can see here is that there is a lot of historic focus has been on Enyandra, and then to a lesser extent on Entomin. And the rest really uh, what we're calling the kind of GNT, the greater and Tomei-Tonimbo area is very much sort of untapped, right? And uh, <clears throat> so, the, so the focus as we look at, uh, uh, at look at 10 uh, is to be focusing on the bigger kind of most cost, more cost-effective pools uh, in the GNT area. Um, I think for those of you who followed the company in the past, you would have come across uh, disappointments with 10, it's not disappointment with 10 per se, it's been disappointments with Enyendra. Uh, and that continues to be a challenge, to be honest with you. So about 20% of the oil in place is in 10, right? And that's where, like I said, our historic focus is. But geologically, it's probably the most complex field. And even today, uh, it continues to surprise us. Uh, but that's not to take away from the fact that there is a tremendous resource uh, across uh, the 10 fields. Uh, and uh, this, the, the, the focus really for us is to understand that opportunity set and recognize that the 10 FPSO uh, actually has a lot of capacity. So that FPSO was designed to produce 80 to 100,000 barrels a day, and it's only producing about 80. So there is a tremendous opportunity there to, to, to bring more, uh, <laughs> more oil and gas uh, uh, to, uh, through the FPSO. So, so that's a little bit of, of a perspective on Ghana. Uh, let me switch gears and talk about our non-operated portfolio. And this is really, if you remember, we've sold our business in Equatorial Guinea. So what we are really talking about is principally Gabon and to some extent, uh, <clears throat> uh, Cote d'Ivoire, right? And what I'm pleased here is that this is a, a place where there is a really good collaboration between uh, our non-operated team, our geoscience, our exploration team, uh, and <clears throat> also with our joint venture partners. Uh, and the way I look at this business is and encourage just is to say, we've had, it's a steady kind of production business. We've got lots of opportunities near existing infrastructure, which can come on stream quickly. 
help us sustain that production and cash flow. And production, you know, post the cut of divestments, it's been steady in, in 2021. We expect this to continue uh, in 2022. And, and the production in 21 was steady despite some issues we have experienced at SPOR, which was shut down for quite a few months. It just came back on stream. Uh, and, and, and where uh, we've been able to address that or, or, or to, to capture additional production has been in Simba. And I just showed that on the chart on the top right. Uh, that's a very exciting field. And, and uh, we, after the sales that we did earlier, which was the uh, EG, the Ecofield Guinea and the Dusupu field, we allocated, reallocated capital, I should say, uh, to Simba and we accelerated the expansion. That's the light blue that you see. And, and that's the Simba 3 well that's come on stream. And we're looking at a debottlenecking project for the evacuation pipeline. And with that, we should be able to double the production. So this was before, prior to this project coming on stream, uh, we were on a gross basis about seven, I think 7,000 barrels a day, and we're targeting probably 13,000 on a gross basis. Uh, and that matters because we have a 57.5% interest here. So this is a good example. The reason I want to showcase this was because it's a good example of how even as a non-operator, we're able to add value in this particular instance through uh, our kind of geoscience focus. I think then <clears throat> I wanted to switch gears to talk about uh, our uh, positions in the emerging basins. And, and this is really kind of the legacy <clears throat> exploration portfolio. Now, our exploration strategy is very clear, uh, which is around kind of principal focus is leveraging the geoscience capability. This is a lot of good talent in Tello. Leveraging that capability around our producing assets. So you'd see us do a lot more, for example, in Simba or in other projects in Gabon, do a lot more in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, do a lot more in, in Ghana. Uh, which is about finding additional barrels where there is infrastructure. But we also have some very exciting legacy positions. So, um, so we have uh, uh, Guyana, obviously, which is a hotspot, uh, and, uh, and also have a material position in, in, uh, in Argentina. And our, our, our objective across these is to minimize our capital exposure, uh, with, and, but still try and retain some sort of carried interest. Now, I think even though oil prices have improved, we haven't seen the exploration farm out market improve that much. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll see kind of how our farm out efforts increase, but there's a chance that we may end up, particularly in Guyana, we have a wealth commitment in a Repsol operated block next year. Uh, so we may have, have, have uh, to allocate capital to that, uh, but in some ways it's fine because it's a very interesting prospect. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> And we'd see either we end up kind of reducing our capital exposure or we end up bringing data from these activities, which will hopefully strengthen the position and allow us to add value, you know, from future portfolio management. So, so that's a strategy. What you will not see us do, and I want to be very clear on this, is what you will not see us do is go out and raise or get more frontier exploration blocks. Let me just quickly move on to uh, to the Kenya project, and and I have to be honest with you. When I came last year, I arrived at Tello. I was, I was quite skeptical about this project, and again, those of you who've been involved with the company, you'll probably know there's many, many false starts, and there was a history of disappointment. But because the scale of the resource was large, uh, we decided that we really needed to kind of have a objective kind of, you know, root branch to view, if you will, of the project to understand that. So, and, you know, we worked with our partners, both Africa Oil and Total. We benefited from all the data they had and their perspectives. And also uh, there had been an extended, uh, what they call an early oil production scheme, which is basically like an extended well test. And so the gold dust in a sense in our business of, of testing is when you get real production data because everything else is kind of static. It's like cross sections of seismic data or well logs, it's all static, but the production data is, 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 is very powerful. So we incorporated that and all that kind of led to a different picture. So firstly, if you look at the chart on the left, our oil in place estimates increased quite dramatically. Right? And by the way, these data were validated not only from the dynamic production data from the early oil uh, production scheme, but they also have been independently assessed by uh, by Gaffney Klein. 
Gaffney Klein also assessed that uh, the work that we did, which supports on the right, which is an increase in the recoverable oil. So you are interested in how much oil can we actually recover. Uh, and that's an increase uh, from about 433 million barrels to 585 million barrels. So, so that was a good, good thing. And then the key really in a resource like this is which is onshore resources, the infrastructure. Because once you have the infrastructure in place, then subsequent uh, developments, the commercial threshold of those is quite low. So the key is to say, well, how do I justify the, the, the development of the infrastructure? And that revised development concept is based on uh, <clears throat> a higher plateau of 120,000 barrels a day. And I think we recognized while we were doing the development plan, we recognized a very simple fact, which is the production, this is nature, right? So production potential varies across each field. And because you're onshore, what you can do in a simple sense is do you drill the best parts of each field first, which allows you to get to a higher plateau. And with less wells initially, uh, and that makes the economics of the infrastructure much more viable. And once you have the infrastructure in place, then you can bring on the smaller wells uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, much more effectively. So that's the kind of concept. Uh, what we're doing now, uh, we've been very open about this, is we're seeking strategic partners based on the revised plan. We like the project, but we have a finite balance sheet. I think I talked about our, our capital allocation. We talked about our priorities of delivering cash, paying down debt. Uh, so once we like this, uh, we feel it's more important for us to bring somebody else in to help fund the next stage. And, uh, and also what we're doing is in parallel, we're working with our partners to improve the environmental footprint of the project. So reducing carbon emissions, uh, utilizing renewable sources of power, and also looking to supply water to local communities. So, so all this kind of, I think is in a good place as a project. I think a critical next step is securing uh, a strategic partnership. Uh, it'd be hard to give a time frame around that, uh, but we're working very closely with the government uh, on, of Kenya as well on this. So let me just bring it all together because I just want to leave some time for questions. So we've spoken a lot today about the future, but also we're building on a, hopefully now you'll see kind of a credible track record uh, <clears throat> where we've turned the company around. Uh, and the assurance we want to give you as our shareholders is that we as the leadership team are very committed to continuing uh, uh, that momentum. Uh, we are much more aligned with our partners. I think uh, uh, humility is an important thing. I think we learn from our partners. Uh, it's leaving, you know, getting us better ideas. Uh, there are more effective ways of working. I think culture is quite important. We're developing a much more open culture. Uh, it, People tell us really good. I've been continued to be impressed with the uh, with the commitment the team has, uh, and I think as we move through this transition year, our priority is very used to be we remain very focused on delivering the targets. Uh, we'll continue to keep a close eye on costs. I think with rising oil prices, that's always a challenge. This is, I was telling somebody yesterday. I said this is like my sixth upturn, and it's the same story every time. Uh, so you need to keep a really close eye on costs. Uh, and generating cash flows and repaying debt. Uh, but also I feel like we're earning our place to look at uh, uh, growth. And I think we're well positioned to emerge as a leader in, uh, in Africa. So I think I've tried to keep to the time that Alex kind of mandated. So, so let me stop here and uh, happy to take questions, Alex. Rahul, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that run through. I think it was pretty comprehensive, but it has um, uh, generated a lot of questions. Um, and we're going to start in one, which is uh, we've had two or three on this topic, and it's regarding the Cosmos purchase of the Oxy uh, Ghana assets. Um, and a couple of questions here. One is, does Tullo have any preemptive rights that they can exercise? And if so, is the board looking to take these up in view of the current oil price? Um, and something on the valuation here of the, the, the implied valuation for Tullo's Ghana stake of approximately 1.25 billion. Is that, um, uh, you know, what's your view on that valuation, basically? Okay, so it is a kind of a live 
thing. So we'll have to be careful with our choice of words. Uh, let me, you know, Les has been doing a lot of thinking on this and we've had obviously good discussions on this. So maybe let me invite Les and he'll try to answer the question to the best of our abilities, recognizing that it's a, you know, fairly live and confidential situation. Yeah, perfect. No, thank, thanks, Rahul. So I'll address the two parts of the, the question. Clearly, I think as, as is widely acknowledged, uh, Ox has been seeking to sell these assets for what, the best part of three years now. So you could certainly put them in the, in the camp of being, a, in some degree, a distressed seller of these assets. With respect to the, the value, I'd point you, I think, to two things. One is in the release that Cosmos put out, they to, do provide an assessment of what they see the value at $65, which is considerably higher than the, the price that they're, they're uh, being paid or, be, or paying rather. And then the second thing I would point you to is that uh, now as part of our bond, we are publishing our 2 pn TV. Uh, and we did that at the beginning of the year based on our tracks, so our independent auditive reserves. And then we updated that as a requirement under our bond, which is available on our website. And if you go to our website, you can see, and these are actually at much lower prices than the, the forward curve is uh, as of today. We're saying for our portion of our assets uh, in excess of around about $3 billion for our assets. So I, I, that's just two data points that I think I hope you find helpful. Then with respect to the uh, preemption right, I, I certainly won't speculate about what we will do, because that would be inappropriate. Uh, but yes, we do have a preemption right. That was confirmed in the release uh, by Cosmos. So we certainly agree with that. And what also is worth clarifying is that's only over part of the interest. So for those of you that are familiar, we have two licenses, what we call the DWP, and then so Deepwater Tunnel and the West Cape Three Points. Uh, all of 10 is in DWP and part of Jubilee, not quite, but about half is in uh, West Cape Three Points. And the arithmetic for that, because I won't take us through the arithmetic, is covered actually in the Cosmos release. So you can actually see if all partners were to preempt, and that's ourselves and Petro SA, they've actually described what the impact of that would be. So I think all the, the numbers are out there in the, in the public domain. Uh, and like I say, I won't speculate about what we would choose, choose to do, but it's something that we will look at. Thank you, Les, uh, for, for that. Uh, two further questions, which I'm going to group together in the sort of M&A field. One is a general question which says, are you looking to sell down any further assets or farm out further assets? And the more specific question is, you have interest in two blocks offshore Guyana in Carapace and Oriduik. Are you selling down or farming down these blocks? Could you update us on that, please? Sure, let me take those. So I think uh, last year, uh, when we were in the midst of kind of you know, sorting out our capital structure, we had said we were open to people approaches, but our criteria was very clear that if somebody offered us a lot more value uh, and if, if it was accretive from a leverage point of view, we would consider it. Uh, I think as running a public company and we're running it for, for the benefit of our shareholders, uh, one always has to keep that in mind. So somebody puts a big number on the table, uh, you have to consider it. The, the thing I would say to you is that our imperative for looking to, to sell assets uh, is not there anymore. And we believe that we can certainly create a lot of value by investing in the assets that we have. And you've heard me talk about the high returns. And, and you know, when you have you know, 50, 75% IRR projects, you're better off allocating capital and growing those assets. And, and also we've created the self-funded funded business plan. So I would say no imperative to sell, but you know, our, we're duty bound if, 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 if somebody puts a big number, <laughs> you have to consider it. Uh, I think uh, having said that the focus, uh, we are reducing our exposure uh, in, in, uh, in Guyana. I think I, I, I alluded to this. So we have two blocks. I think there is the Kanuku block and the Oroduit block. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a process underway right now of looking at potentially farming down 
uh, a stake in Kaluku. Uh, we have not done anything on or do it yet, uh, but but we would certainly look to to do that. And as I said earlier, uh, given the state of the market, it's not quite recovered. So we're not sure, you know, how that process is going to unfold, but we'll see. Uh, and similarly, just to remind you, uh, we are looking to reduce our exposure in Kenya as well. Thank you. Um, some questions here quite specifically on the financing and, and I guess, sorry, the hedging, I should say. Does the 30th of June 2021 position include the increased hedge required as part of the conditions of the debt refinancing in May? And if not, how will the new hedging profile look? Let me uh, uh, invite Les to address that question, Alex. Hey, Alex, there might be two or three questions on hedging. So I don't know if you want to, from what I see in the Q&A list, yeah, those, then, then, then what I'll do is I'll try and answer it in the round and address Okay, this. fine. Let me read out the other, the other two hedging questions which are here, which is, uh, given the ratios and expiries are not disclosed, it is impossible to determine the amount of upside being forfeited from the short calls. Could you please confirm the full payout profile and at what underlying all price the long calls offset the short calls? And the final question on, on sort of hedging here is to what extent does Tullow benefit from the current and seemingly future strong price of crude oil? Great, no, thank you. I, I just thought it was worth, because I will address it in the, in the round. So I think it's certainly all those that are, are holders and probably everybody on the call, they will know uh, Tullow's hedged for a long time now as part of its financial risk uh, management. It served us well. We don't second guess uh, oil price. If you look last year, we had over 200 million of revenue in the downturn came from uh, hedging. Uh, we've historically approached this on a 60%, a 30% basis, so budget year and then a year after. We do it on, on a rolling basis. Uh, we do it on calendar year. Uh, tracks, if you like, and we do it little by little so that we get to that position over the course of the year. As for sort of the first part of the question, when we did the refinancing in May, we were obliged to increase uh, such that we were from May uh, this year for two years, so through to May 23, and then a the year after, so the first two years at 75% and then 50%. What we were able to do was to take advantage of an existing program. And actually in the calendar year for 2021, because of the disposals that Rahul had referred to earlier, we were already at the 75%. And because these are done on a rolling basis versus the, the timing of the bond, you'll see we, we publish in our results, uh, both at half year and the full year, the status of our hedging program. So you will see on our website and also in our half year result data, we've provided quite a bit of detail on the, on the, on the program. Uh, and it's worth just noting that because these are May to May, when you do the arithmetic on a calendar basis, uh, for 2022, that is 75, but for 23, it becomes 60%. And for 24, it becomes about 21%. So it's worth recognizing that. So as we go out in time, uh, until such times as we add any future hedges in, uh, our exposure to the pool upside increases over time. What we've been doing is we been laying in hedges, as you know, I think at 55 floors. We were obliged to do the first half of the program in the first two weeks. So we had no, no choice about that. Then the next half by the middle of August and then amended by the end of the year. What that meant was that as we've seen prices rise over the course of the year, the floor that we described, or rather the color that we described at the half year, we've been able to improve that over the course of the year. Uh, that's something we will update uh, when we get to fill the results. But just for people's information, the average call was 72 for 22, 69 for 22, and 69 for 24. But like I say, we've been able to take advantage of the rising market and we've still got just like three or four million barrels to hedge before the year end, but we've been able to increase those uh, weighted average calls 
above uh, the 70s dollar mark into the middle of the 70s. So uh, all in all, a program which uh, is well founded on protection to the downside with exposure to the upside. And I think you'll be able to uh, illustrate from what we put out in the public domain, and we'll give some more detail at the end of the year, uh, what uh, uh, impact is as to oil price. Maybe just one thing before I complete, as we did give an update at the half year uh, as to what was the impact in the, the first half of both the premium and also the uh, reduction as a result of the hedge program. And that was about $52 million, which was about, uh, about just under $5 per barrel impact when I realized uh, price. Of course, that was, um, uh, all price was on, were more in the 60s at that point. And of course, we're at a much higher point today. So hopefully I've addressed all the, the components of the, the question. Okay, thank you, Les. Um, I've got a couple of questions here on, on ESG. And I'm going to ask them together because I think they should be grouped together. So the first one is, how exactly do you intend to reduce your emissions to reach the net zero target? Um, and the second question relates to specifically to gas flaring. Um, your gas flaring appears to be up again this year by quite a significant amount in Ghana. And how does that square with your ESG goals? Can you maintain production levels without flaring? So let me take that, Alex. Um, so our net zero kind of ambition is driven by uh, three things. So the first is the elimination of routine flaring. And the second is uh, through some efficiency is sort of investment. So uh, around making some of our equipment run better. And the third, which is really around the kind of more residual kind of harder to evade emissions, uh, that's going to be through nature-based carbon offsets. So those are the three uh, components. Now, on the first one, what we're looking to do, if you remember I said, is that where does the, the flaring come from? So it's associated gas. And uh, the more gas we can sell, uh, well, firstly, the more gas we process uh, and the more gas we sell, the less we flare. So uh, we've been, now our target is to get to kind of 120, 130 million scups a day of consistent offtake. I think we're pretty much there. Uh, next year, we deferred our shutdown, the Jubilee shutdown to next year. And then there is a 10 shutdown plan in 23 as well. So over the next two years, let's say between 22 and 23, we're gonna be look, making investments in de-bottlenecking further gas processing capacity. And that's a key enabler cup, coupled with consistent offtake. Those two things will help us uh, eliminate routine flaring. So there's a very clear path. That capital spend is part of our business plan. So when I talked about the five-year plan, that's very much integral into the business plan. That's the first component. The second component I talked about, which is uh, a, smaller investments making our efficient our equipment more efficient so that's things like rewiring compressors and things like that those investments are also integral or integrated into the business plan so that that probably takes us to about halfway on our net zero ambition then the third component is nature-based carbon offsets and that's a fancy word of saying how do i kind of do a project which is either mitigation of deforestation or reforestation. And we're fortunate to be operating in countries in Africa where there is a tremendous opportunity there. Now that's a skill set that's different from what we have. So we have made a concerted effort to bring in specialist advisors and also to add to our team. And that's one where we've done initial screening projects, but I would love to be able to come back next year and showcase the sorts of things we're doing. So very clear, very deliberate sort of plan. Uh, and we don't have the nature-based capital spend in the business plan, but everything else is there. Okay, thank you, Rahul. We're gonna move on to a specific uh, tax question. Um, any progress in resolving the ongoing tax dispute with the Ghanaian revenue authorities? According to your interim report, the tax claim against you is over $400 million. Uh, yeah, Les, you want to? I'll have you. Take yeah, that. sure. Yeah, happy to address that. Though. 
Yes, we gave a, an update in our uh, first half results uh, based on a letter that we received to the tuna that was 471 million, to be precise. Uh, myself, Rahul, and the rest of the senior leadership team, we were actually down in Ghana, well, I think it was about just over two weeks ago, and we took the opportunity while we were there to engage with quite a broad set of uh, stakeholders, and this was one of the topics that we discussed when we were down there. Uh, and since that uh, meet, set of meetings, uh, myself, uh, Wissam, who runs a, a Ghana business, uh, we've been engaging with the local authorities. So I think all I can say at this point is that there's discussions ongoing uh, and we'll provide an update when there's uh, more, more information to be pro uh, provided. But discussions are, on, are, in, are ongoing. Okay. A uh, question here about your uh, capital structure and, and they're, they're linking it to the oil prices. So oil prices are now significantly higher than management's forecast at the last capital markets day. Tullow's free cash flow should be greater than 100 million this year. Um, a key impediment to the re-rating of Tullow share price is the total debt outstanding. Why is management not using the additional free cash flow and the ability under the restricted payment test for the 2026, 2026 note to launch a tender to buy back some of the 2025 notes, which trade significantly below par? It would reduce debt, capture debt service savings and be immediately accretive to shareholders. Would you be able to comment on that? Sure. So I, I think it's a good, good question and it's a, it's a capital allocation question and it's something that we think about constantly. So I'll just tell you. So today, the 25 notes, the price is 87.375. That's actually as of last night. So that's about a yield uh, to worst at uh, about 11.64%. So from a cost of capital, from a return on capital point of view, we have investment opportunities that exceed that by a big, big margin. So you as shareholders would then say, okay, do I have a choice to invest in an 11.64% return asset or should I invest in something that's generating a 50% return? So, so that's the debate that, that, that we go through. Uh, also, uh, I, I've always been intrigued by this idea of kind of buying back bonds and we've looked at it a number of times. And, and the, the challenge just to be, be transparent with you guys has always been that you never get enough liquidity uh, in these bonds to make a meaningful impact. So you go through a lot of heartache, a lot of exercise, but you never get enough uh, liquidity to make a meaningful impact. So, but it's not to say that that's something we don't consider, uh, but it's a, it's a, partly it's a capital allocation question and partly it's a, it's a, it's a question of kind of doability and whether we see kind of there's enough liquidity in the market for it to, 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 to mean much, but be rest assured, it's something that we think about. Uh, but we haven't so far gotten ourselves to a stage where we say, okay, let's kind of go ahead and do this. Okay, thank you, Rahul. A uh, question here about uh, the Ghana. Uh, when do you see revenues from Ghana, from gas sales in Ghana materializing? So, in, and this is important again. So, I'll talk about gas in Ghana in three pieces. So, there is associated gas, first of all. So, that's the gas that's dissolved in the oil, it comes out when you produce it. It is non-associated gas that exists in the rocks, separate phase compared to oil. Today, we're only producing associated gas. There is an agreement which has been in place for a number of years with the government of Ghana to sell what is uh, under what is called a foundation gas agreement. Right? And that's roughly, I think from memory, it's about 200 billion cubic feet of gas. Uh, at the rates that we're producing right now, the foundation gas agreement expires at the end of next year. Uh, the foundation gas was provided free to the government. This is an agreement I think that goes back to its several years, uh, I think seven, eight years, even before. Uh, so that foundation gas agreement uh, expires at the end of next year. We'll be discussing with the government of Ghana as to what the arrangements are going to be for selling the associated gas beyond the end of 2022 into 23. We expect we'll get some monetary value for it, but it will be probably one of the cheaper sources of gas uh, in Ghana. But I can't uh, today tell you what that gas price is going to be. So that's the second bucket of gas. The third is, once we have that understanding on the pricing formula for the associated gas, 
then we will have a separate discussion with the government on the pricing formula for the non-associated gas. Uh, but that's not really something that we're pushing at right now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, coming sort of, sort of taking a sort of step up and looking at, at a slightly sort of top down higher level, could you sort of give some examples of what has changed in the company in terms of culture, strategy and operations since you joined? So I would say fundamentally, I mean, today Tullo is a very different company from where we were say in 2019, okay? And let me start with the objective measure. So if you think about our capital allocation, so today we're very much a production oriented company. So 90 plus percent of our capital as we look today is allocated to unlocking value from our producing assets. If you compare that same number to say the period 2017, 18, 19, so over that three year period, that was, we were probably allocating about 50% of our capital to producing assets, right? So that's, that's one difference. I think the focus of the company and where we see value creation, like I said, is from investing in our existing assets, right? That means that a lot of the focus is around building and operating capability. And the one big difference I'll, I'll tell you, Alex, is that when you're running an operating business, then the details matter, right? And we say this to ourselves, and this is an important thing, that we're in a culture where you know, every <laughs> barrel matters, every dollar counts. That's a level of detail and focus uh, that perhaps if you were running an exploration company, you didn't need that, right? So you, and, and therefore what happens is that the collaboration of the team becomes a lot more important, right? So, so you see more attention to detail, you see a lot more rigor around costs, uh, and hopefully what you see from us is a lot of discipline around capital allocation, uh, and, but a very clear value proposition, which is that I would say to you as a shareholders would be, that if you buy shares in Tullo, you have good visibility that through the work that we're doing, we have line of sight that we can replace, perhaps grow our reserve base over the next few years. That means you keep your enterprise value flat. We generate a lot of cash flow. We're using that cash flow to repay that. But if I keep my enterprise value flat, all of the cash that I use to repay that, that accretes value through equity, right? And you've got line of sight on that. In addition to that, you've got optionality from Kenya, you've got optionality from unlocking value from Guyana. Uh, and we believe we're in a world where there is a tremendous opportunity set for companies like ours who have the operating capability, who have the experience in Africa. So I think it's a three part story to me, which hopefully I think people find interesting. I mean, that's certainly what inspires us. So that hope, you know, hopefully Alex, that gives you a flavor of maybe what's changed, but also what we're about. Yeah, no, it certainly does. Thank you. Um, I've got a question in here, which is a sort of follow-up to, I think, uh, a, a question that you answered earlier. Um, so if you're not in a farm down process on Oridoyuk, are you planning to drill on the block next year? No, so on Kanuku, we have a well obligation next year. Oridoyuk, there isn't a well obligation next year. So, so we're not planning to drill in our own it next year. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to the gas price here, how, how has the recent uh, gas price hike impacted you? <laughs> Unfortunately, it, 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 it hasn't. Well, not directly, certainly, it, it, it hasn't. Uh, because I think, as I explained earlier, uh, we w were selling, well, we're providing gas to the government of, or GNGC under the foundation gas agreement where we don't get any price. So unfortunately it doesn't, we we're not benefiting from that. Okay, thank you. Um, and now looking back at the, the Jubilee and the 10 fields, can you just explain the difference between the Jubilee and the 10 fields and why the initial focus is more on Jubilee and uh, I guess production questions, what is the current production level at uh, 10 and is the gas injector online yet? So let me start with this simple. So uh, production levels of 10, at around 30,000 barrels a day. Uh, and the gas injector just came online. We're injecting uh, gas as we speak. Uh, so the impact of that 
hasn't come through yet. But I think it literally, I think it came on stream last week. Uh, the difference between Jubilee and Tenant, and I think about this a lot, it, it's, let me start with the, with the subsurface, right? So Jubilee is 2 billion barrels, 10 is a billion, right? It, Jubilee is a relatively simpler field. So we are looking at recovery factors in the kind of 40 plus percent. 10 is more complex. If you remember, I said it's made up of multiple fields, uh, different geology across those fields. We're looking at recovery factors across 10 in the kind of low 30s, right? So 10 more complex, uh, uh, Jubilee kind of, you know, simpler. And that's, that's important, right? And that translates into, into uh, uh, lower recovery factors. If you look at the infrastructure, and I start with the seabed, and you remember the picture I showed you on the pipelines, the kind of manifold, it's a subsea infrastructure. Uh, Jubilee has quite a lot of subsea infrastructure. If you, I don't know if you remember this from the picture I showed you, the stuff in gray. Uh, 10 has less subsea infrastructure, right? Why? Because in 10, we focused a lot on Enyandra, which is a very small slice of the greater area in 10. So you can go back to those slides and have a look at that. So Jubilee has more subsea infrastructure, 10 has less. Okay. What that means therefore is that to facilitate the 10 development, you need more, more subsea infrastructure relative to 10. Now, if you go to the surface and you compare the FPSOs, uh, uh, Jubilee, the, the KNK is an older FPSO. And many of you will remember the tidal remediation project, so it had more challenges there. Uh, it has less spare capacity. In fact, we're constantly debottlenecking. So you've heard me talk about increasing gas processing capacity, water handling capacity. Uh, we're planning, you know, a an upgrade to the overall processing capacity in the next couple of years in in, in Jubilee. Uh, Ten, on the other hand, has is a newer FPSO. Uh, I was there on both of those, and it's it's interesting when you go there, you could really tell the differences. Uh, but but ten has a lot more spare facilities, so we call ullage. So ten has more ullage. So so that's hopefully along kind of three dimensions: so subsurface, uh, subsea infrastructure, and facilities. Uh, you have the differences now. What that means, therefore, is it translates into very different strategic focus. So when we look at capital allocation. Uh, because you have a lot more existing subsea infrastructure, more money is going into Jubilee and we're doing more on debottlenecking in Jubilee, right? Because 10 is many fields. Historically, we've invested mostly or focused on Nyendra. So there is a lot more work geotechnically on understanding uh, 10. So when you look at our capital spend in 10, uh, um, we'll be drilling a couple of strategic wells over the next uh, two years uh, to help frame that opportunity better. And under the current plan, and I'm not saying this is what we'll do eventually, but in the current plan, simplistically, if I took a 10-year view, the first five years, because of all the reasons that I described, are more Jubilee heavy, and the back end of the program is more 10 heavy, right? But I suspect, and please don't hold me to this, but I suspect that as, we, as the plans evolve, uh, you'll probably get a blend of the two. But certainly, if you look near term, I mean, this year, for example, you know, of our drilling program, I think we'll have four Jubilee wells and one 10 well. And that tells you a little bit about kind of the, the, the focus. And, and, but we're trying to change that. So next year, we'll try to see what the right mix is of, of, the, of the wells. But hopefully that's, I've tried to maybe simplify it, but, but hopefully that's clear in terms of kind of at a high level what the key differences are. Yeah, no, that's, that's very helpful, Rahul. Um, we're sort of coming to the end of uh, the webinar today, so I, I think I just want to ask a question uh, which sort of looks forward, really, and ask you, what are your ambitions for Tullow over the next five years? Look, I, it's in, in some ways, it's very simple, right? So companies like ours, we've occupied the white space that the big boys leave behind, right? So my addressable market, for Tullow, the addressable market is what the majors don't do. And, and what's exciting to us is that that white space is increasing. Okay, because the majors are exiting a lot of emerging markets, particularly in Africa. We so happens that the skills required for us to succeed in that are the very same skills that we need to unlock value from our assets. So I think our focus really is if we keep our head down and we execute well on what we are doing, we will A, deliver value, all the stuff that I talked about, but also I think Alex, it prepares us 
or opportunities that we think are going to come our way. We don't have to rush out and do stuff, but we think the world is moving towards where Talo is today. So, and, and I think with the commitment on net zero, with the focus on shared prosperity, uh, with the focus on managing you know, and mitigating the environmental footprint, I think we're well-placed uh, to be a responsible, that's key, to be a responsible developer of, of resources and to add value to the host countries that we're in, to the host communities that we work in. So that's something we feel proud of that defines who we are. Uh, so yeah, so that's the story. Well, thank you for that. Um, it certainly feels like a lot of uh, a lot of things are going on and you're really delivering on uh, what you're laying out and, and there's some exciting uh, times ahead. So thank you very much Rahul and Les for that uh, uh, clear presentation and for answering all those questions. I do apologize if we haven't been able to cover all the questions today. We had a lot that came through during the webinar. We tried to cover as many as possible. Um, I just want to flag up um, a couple of things. As you leave today's webinar, you'll come to a, a short uh, feedback survey. If you'd be kind enough to complete that, that would be really helpful. We'd like to try and give some comprehensive feedback to management after these events. I know they find it uh, useful. So please, if you could spend a couple of moments uh, completing that. Just to highlight a couple of webinars that we've got coming up um, next week, or well, not the two weeks time, uh, we've got Trident Royalties following that on the 18th of November, Castings. And then later on to November, we've got uh, Sainsbury's and then Halma. So a couple of webinars to put in your diary. Um, and finally, just to say thank you to everyone for attending today. And again, thank you to Rahul and Les for presenting so clearly. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank everybody. you very much. Thanks, everybody.